Recently, I came across someone saying that God had a wife in the Bible. She was forcefully exiled by some people who hated her, and she's getting ready to take her rightful position in the Godhead. It is not true. While I am aware of the female presence in God's heavenly kingdom, the counterfeit goddess that cries foul is straight from the abyss of Lucifer's aquatic kingdom. Even though she hates humans, she is very good at stoking their emotions. We all love our mothers, don't we? So, she has chosen the very image of a mother to carry out her deception. What better way than this to deceive a bunch of gullible humans? When she appeared in the human realm as the ancient Assyrian queen Semiramis or Shamuramit, she killed her mate, whom the Hindus worship today as Lord Shiva. This incident is commemorated even today by keeping a vigil on Mahashivratri, which is the great night of Shiva. Shiva was an able-bodied man and she altered his gender making him Ardhanari, meaning half-woman. As for women, she forced them to have unconsented sex with a stranger in order to fulfill their sacred duty towards her. All that the stranger had to do was to say, I invite you in the name of Melita and throw a coin in the woman's lap. Then the woman is obligated to follow the stranger and have sex with him. So much for the liberating power of the goddess. Meanwhile, the goddess also slept with a new soldier every night, only to kill him by the morning. She was also the first one in human history who castrated males and made them her palace gods, known as eunuchs. In her religion, there were temple prostitutes of both male and females. However, she didn't come to help any of them when they were dying of sexually transmitted diseases. Greek historian Herodotus, who lived in the 5th century before Christ, says the following. They have no physicians, but when a man is ill, they lay him in the public square, and the passers-by come up to him, and if they have ever had his disease themselves, or have known anyone who has suffered from it, they give him advice, recommending him to do whatever they found good in their own case, or in the case known to them and no one is allowed to pass the sick man in silence without asking him what his ailment is. One more trait of this goddess is that if she finds any community in any part of the world, she has to sneak in as the mother of their nation, the mother nature, fertility goddess, goddess of war, angel of justice, goddess of childbirth, and so on. She infiltrated ancient Israelites, claiming herself to be the wife of Yahweh. So many artifacts have been unearthed in Israel with inscriptions claiming that she is the wife of Yahweh. Prophets warned the Israelites to keep away from her. Because of their refusal to heed the warning, God allowed the Assyrians and the Babylonians to take them away as captives. She was known as Allah's wife in Arabia, more legitimately so. It is because in pre-Islamic Arabia, the main deity of Kaaba was Hubel, which is the biblical Tammuz. Mana was the mother of Hubel. Sumerians called her Ishtar, and Ishtar is the queen Semiramis. Then the same mother goddess went lusting after her own son Hubel in the form of Alusa. Meanwhile, Hubel fell in love with another beautiful girl named Psyche, 
whom the Arabians called Alet, meaning the wife of Allah. Even today, whatever happens around Kaaba is all to do with these goddesses. See the level of infiltration. In India, this spirit was being worshipped as Durga, Kali, and by many other names. But that is not enough for the goddess. Some people were worshipping an ill-fated deity known as Renuka. Before anyone knew, Renuka's shrine was called after this goddess, namely Yalama, meaning the mother of boundaries. It's because Semiramis built city walls. By the way, her other name Durga means fortress because once again she built fortresses. Now at the renamed Elamos temple, young girls were dedicated for temple prostitution just like in Ishtar temples of Sumer and they are taught to sing the same vulgar songs the temple prostitutes of Sumer used to sing to their devotees even today. She performed the same deception in Egypt as well. Egyptians were worshipping their ancestral queen Isis as a deity. She stepped in there claiming that she is Isis. Now the so-called goddess is from the abyss of the sea which is the home of the fallen angels. Whereas Isis is a perfect human being born of Noah's son Ham and his sister Rhea. How can they be the same? This spirit has her ways of deceiving and taking over everything. Now to Rome. In the 4th century, Rome became Christian. She sneaked in there as well with the guise of Mary. Mary was never worshipped by Christians before the 4th century. All the attributes of the mother goddess was transferred upon her and because of all that, Wiccans rightfully claim Mary as their goddess even today. Our next stop is the United States of America. When the Puritans came to America in the 17th century, they dressed like this. Now, with her clever suggestion and a bit of motivation, she made them take off their clothes too. The culture she promotes hasn't changed a bit over the ages. She is dangerous. Her strategy is to pit women against men in order to break down families and societies. She sneaks into civilizations by luring and later enslaves them. So many people living under her yoke don't even know what freedom is, even though they talk about it all the time. They think it is normal to have chronic illnesses, broken families, abortions, guilt and shame, heartbreaks, depression, accidents, brush with the law, surprise expenses, premature deaths, insurance hikes, constant debts, needing a second and a third job to survive and all the rest are a part of normal life. But it is not meant to be. God loves his children. He sent his son Jesus to pay for our sins. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Ask him to come into your life. Enjoy the perfect rest that he promised for his children, just as I do. God bless you.